So uh, here is uh, Gilbert Harmon's um, A Defense of Ethical Relativism, which again is an excerpt from a, a book. So I haven't read the book, but I doubt, doubt very much that there's any part of it that's actually called A Defense of Ethical Relativism. We have to understand we're working with a, an anthology mostly consisting of excerpts and the titles are, are supplied by the editors of our anthology, but there's, so they may or may not be directly um, the best titles for these things, but that's okay. Um, I think that uh, something I said in class about the word convention or conventional uh, is maybe pretty obvious, but I think helpful. Uh, when we think of the word conventional, we, we often think of it as a synonym uh, for artificial, and that's fine. Um, but it, one of the things that needs to sink in is that a convention is an agreement. Um, you know, the constitutional convention when the uh, representatives of the American states had to get together and hash out something like a federal constitution for the United, to create the United States, um, they had to make an agreement. And, and that is certainly a, a, a key part of, it, let's call it Harmon's conventionalism, that a, a convention is an agreement between people. And that agreement is to act a certain way, to, to follow certain rules or to, to engage in certain typical behaviors. And Harmon is a conventionalist. He believes that that is really the origin of, uh, of morality. That is the origin of moral practices and rules and perhaps even beliefs about what is good, that they are the result of, con of a convention, uh, an agreement between people to act in a certain way. He gives us certain examples here, right? Uh, the first one is about two farmers making a convention, basically an agreement for mutual aid to, to help uh, till each other's fields. Uh, and this convention presumably is what creates moral obligation. If, if farmer A and farmer B make an agreement to help till each other, till each other's fields and uh, farmer A helps farmer B, then farmer B is presumably has a moral obligation to, to help farmer A. Um, <clears throat> as he says, each farmer benefits from this practice, which depends upon their expectation that the other will continue it. Um, that is an important part of his conventionalism, right? That, that moral rules and moral practices uh, turn out to have social utility, um, that they're mutually beneficial. And so when we look at our moral beliefs or our moral practices, we should expect that they do have that kind of social utility, that they are mutually beneficial, um, that they in some way or another are practical and are the kind of things that an individual would rationally enter into or the kind of agreements that an individual would rationally enter into in the sense that they must in some way or another benefit from it just as others benefit from it that it should be mutually beneficial uh, of course we don't think of morality that way on a day-to-day -day basis we just think of what's right and wrong but he has a kind of a, an explanation for that um, and, and that is that conventions eventually turn into habits. Um, so that what is uh, completely arbitrary in a certain way to decide that something's right, I mean, not arbitrary in the sense that it's not socially useful, but arbitrary in the sense that there's nothing particularly morally right about it, will eventually develop into a habitual belief so that if we conventionally enter into these agreements um, for our, just our mutual benefit and live by them long enough that, as he says, the top page 84, eventually habits develop. Actions, action in accordance with those principles becomes relatively automatic. It would be hard to change. Obligations based on those principles come to seem natural and obvious. That's, that's the key. If we do something long enough, we eventually just sort of assume that that's what you do. Uh, if we agree to regard something as right, 
then eventually it'll just seem right. And, and that's a very powerful part of uh, conventionalism, I think, the, this idea that uh, conventions um, eventually come to seem natural and obvious so that we really need to reflect upon them to even sort of think that they might have a conventional origin. Just a sec, sir, I got a delivery. Pause. Sorry for that. Um, so, yeah, the, the idea is that we may not actually realize the conventional origin of our moral beliefs because they become naturalized. Um, but when we run into other cultures, let's say, in the manner of the way that Ruth Benedict perhaps was talking about, the conventional origin or the, the notion that our own morality base, is based upon the particular conventions that we've made might actually stand out. Um, <clears throat> and this is where he uh, brings up the possibility of uh, cannibalism. Um, and what, how does it come out in the sense that, that we might find cannibalism itself to be wrong and clearly wrong? Uh, but we would hesitate to say of any particular person within a culture, within a community that practices cannibalism, that they ought not to have done it. And this is uh, something that he applies in the second section to evaluating somebody like Hitler. Um, but in the cannibalism section, he makes an important distinction on page uh, 55. He says, our reactions to the cannibals are complicated. It's right here. However, because two moralities are relevant, theirs and ours. So I suppose that's where you can say he's not just a, uh, not just a conventionalist, he's a relativist. In judging the situation, we can simply appeal to our own morality. Eating people is wrong. But in judging the cannibals themselves, we must take their morality into account. We cannot simply blame them for what they do because their moral understanding is not the same as ours. They see nothing wrong with eating people. <clears throat> and there is no obvious reason why they should. This is an important point. They have no reason not to do what they do, according to Harmon. This makes it difficult for us to judge that it is wrong of them to eat human flesh. We do not feel comfortable in judging the cannibals themselves to be wrong. It doesn't seem right to say that each of them ought morally not to eat human flesh or that each of them has a moral or duty or obligation not to do so. At best, we might say that it ought not to be the case that they eat human flesh, but as we have seen before, that is not the same sort of judgment at all. But as we may judge the practice, I take them to be saying, but we can't judge the people themselves who follow the practice. Um, from our point of view, he says, we can judge their acts and their situation, even their society and morality, but we cannot, it seems, judge them. And the important point there, I think, is that um, the, the notion that we can only judge somebody to have acted morally wrong if we can imagine that they had reason not to do what they did. And within the conventions of their community they have no such reason. This comes up again later with, with Hitler in this very, I would say, shaky um, comparison of Hitler with Stalin, <clears throat> where both of these people are genocidists. They're responsible for the deaths of millions of people. And we know that what Hitler did was evil and wrong. There's no question about it. But it just, as he says, it just sounds odd. It just sounds a little off to say, sorry, I'm okay. kidding. Just sounds a little off to say Hitler ought not to have done what he did. And, and his reason for that is saying that Hitler, being Hitler, had no reason not to do what he did. That is, I think the idea is that the people in the cannibalistic society are not, uh, because they don't, ex they don't accept the same conventions that we do, um, that 
we cannot judge them as being morally wrong for doing what they do. Hitler, who's just so evil and so beyond the pale, so outside of any imaginable human context, um, Hitler cannot be said to have subscribed to the same conventions we do, where his judgment of Stalin is that he probably did, that is that Stalin probably did have reasons, you know, internally not to do what he did, and he chose to kill people instead, right? As he says on page 56 right here, uh, Hitler is beyond the pale in a way that Stalin was not. Hitler was not just immoral, he was amoral. That is, he didn't have any morality. Not that he just acted badly, he had no real, um, he had no moral sense that would have given him reason not to do what he did. Hitler was not just immoral, he was amoral, he was evil. Stalin was terrible and also perhaps evil, but he was not wholly beyond the reaches of morality as I have imagined him. So it's a, it's a quite an interesting theory. Um, I suppose the idea, the, the main idea here is that we can only judge somebody to have acted morally wrong, in a morally wrong way if they had reason not to do what they did. But the having reason not to do what they did would <clears throat> mean that they subscribed or they had agreed to or entered into a certain convention. And absent that, the notion that, you know, we can morally judge them in, in the usual way uh, is, is not there. It's not possible, which is not to sort of let Hitler off the hook. Um, it's to recognize that somebody like Hitler is just a great, great danger uh, and somebody who should be stopped, but not somebody who we could really fit into our ordinary moral judgments in, in a different way, but in, in some similar way too, to the people who engage in cannibalism. 